Hello and welcome to our worship for Sunday the 4th of July. I'm Stephen Preston and joining me in the service today are Martin Russell and Gordon and Karen who will be leading our communion which we will share later on in the service. Thanks also to Anna Weir who will be signing and as always to Martin Grant and Lewis Hunter who make these services possible. Let us pray. Gracious God, remind us as we worship you that you see not the outside but the person beneath, that you look beyond appearances to the thoughts of the heart. Save us then from empty show or superficial piety and teach us to approach you instead in faith and humility, knowing that your love extends to all who truly seek you. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We sing the hymn, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling. Gracious God, Lord of all, we thank you that we can come in prayer, that for all your greatness and wonder and holiness, we can speak with you as a friend. Hear now our prayer. We thank you that we can open our hearts to you that we can pour out our innermost souls and share our deepest thoughts in the knowledge that you are there, always ready to listen 
and understand. Hear now our prayer. So now once more we lay our lives before you open to your gaze, the bad as well as the good, the doubt as well as the faith, the sorrow as well as the joy, the despair as well as the hope. Hear now our prayer. We bring the anger as well as the peace, the hatred as well as the love, the confusion as well as the certainty, the fear as well as the trust. Hear now our prayer. Gracious God, we bring these not with pride or any sense of arrogance, but honestly, recognizing that you know us through and through. Hear now our prayer. Help us to be truthful to ourselves and truthful to you. And so may we discover the renewing love which only you can offer, a love that frees us to live as you would have us live and allows us to be the people you would have us be. Hear now our prayer in the name of Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, Good morning, everybody. Our reading today is taken from Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 to 17. Colossians 3, verses 1 to 17. And in the NIV, it's entitled, Living as Those Made Alive in Christ. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Here, there is no Gentile or, or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together, in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all the wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit 
singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Amen. Today, I want to think a bit about the difference being a disciple of Jesus, being a Christian, being in Christ, a part of the body, his body, the church, makes or should make to our lives, and in turn, everyone who is a part of our lives. Eugene Peterson, in his introduction to Paul's letter to the Colossians, writes, Hardly anyone who hears the full story of Jesus and learns the true facts of his life and teaching, crucifixion and resurrection, walks away with a shrug of the shoulders, dismissing him as unimportant. People ignorant of the story or misinformed about it, of course, regularly dismiss him. But with few exceptions, the others know instinctively that we are, they are dealing with a most remarkable greatness. But it's quite common for those who consider him truly important to include others who seem to be equally important in his company. Buddha, Moses, Socrates, and Muhammad for a historical start, along with some personal favorites. For these people, Jesus is important, but not central. His prestige is considerable, but he's not preeminent. The Christians in the town of Colossae, or at least some of them, seem to have been taking this line. For them, cosmic forces of one sort or another were getting equal billing with Jesus. Paul writes to them in an attempt to restore Jesus, the Messiah, to the center of their lives. In NIV Church Bibles, today's reading, Colossians 3, 1 to 17, is entitled, Living as Those Made Alive in Christ. Verse 1 sets the tone. Since you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. This image was a popular one for the early church and is the most commonly quoted messianic prophecy in the New Testament, which is taken from Psalm 110, verse 1. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. The book of Hebrews begins... In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom he also made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. It is a fundamental truth that Jesus died but rose again to new life, a life that he shares with all who accept him into their lives. Jesus himself prays shortly before he is crucified. Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. Jesus has risen to new life, and we too have been raised to new life 
with him in him. When we lose sight of that fact, we are apt to go searching for fulfillment, satisfaction, purpose, pleasure, joy, etc., in all manner of different pursuits, beliefs, philosophies, theories, activism, and so on. So if Jesus is to be central to our lives, then we mustn't exclude him from any area of our lives. Jesus is a life changer. He changes lives radically. A few months ago, we were looking at the story of Zacchaeus, the tax collector. Gordon had carried out an informal survey prior to writing his sermon, asking folks what stood out for them in the story. Many of us, including yours truly, homed in on the fact that Zacchaeus was vertically challenged, a wee guy who had to climb a tree to see Jesus. We had become so used to hearing this story and singing choruses about Zacchaeus being a very little man that we'd missed the point. This guy was regarded by his fellow Jericho locals as the scum of the earth, a Roman lackey collecting their taxes while robbing people blind and lining his own pockets. Jesus certainly isn't choosy about who he goes to visit. But it's a life-changing visit for Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Note that after meeting Jesus, we're not told that Zacchaeus was transformed into a six-foot-six giant, but his life would never be the same again. The whole direction of his life was changed. Jesus changes lives forever. Jesus continues today to change lives. Paul never writes to folks to share the latest intellectual theory or idea, the kind so beloved of Greek philosophers who could spend many hours discussing frankly useless topics and theories long before social media. Paul is passionate that the gospel must be preached, received, and lived out in whatever society we are living in. The church must be a beacon to society. He writes, Be wise in the way you act to outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. So as those who are in Christ... There is behavior which is compatible with being a Christian, and there is behavior which is not Jesus-like at all. Paul lists a range of these Jesus-like and non-Jesus-like behaviors, as he often does. He says that a lot of the stuff that used to be associated with them and their old pre-Jesus days has to stop. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived. But now you must also rid yourself of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Don't lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge, in the image of its creator. Here, there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. 
Again, like the story of Zacchaeus, we must be careful not to sanitize the radical call Jesus makes on our lives. If we look at the background of the different folks who are part of the church in Colossae, they are anything but natural bedfellows. Barclay comments, the ancient world was full of barriers. The Greeks looked down on the barbarians, and to the Greeks, anyone who did not speak Greek was a barbarian. The Greeks were the aristocrats of the ancient world, and they knew it. The Jews looked down on every other nation. They belonged to God's chosen people, and the other nations were fit only to be fuel for the fires of hell. The Scythians were notorious as the lowest of the barbarians, more barbarian than the barbarians, the Greeks called them. Scythians were little short of wild animals. The Jewish historian Josephus speaks of them as being proverbially savages who terrorized the civilized world with their bestial atrocities. Slaves were not even classified in ancient law as being human beings. They were merely living tools with no rights of their own. Their masters could thrash or brand or maim or even kill them at will, at whim. They did not even have the right of marriage. There could be no fellowship in the ancient world between slaves and those who were free. Clearly, these folks are not instinctively going to gather round the campfire for a kumbaya sing-along. So let's for a moment consider a couple of folk who were part of the Colossi church. In chapter 4, in his final greetings in this letter, Paul writes, Tychicus will tell you all the news about me. He is a dear brother, a faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. I am sending him to you for the express purpose that you may know about our circumstances and that he may encourage your hearts. He is coming with Onesimus, our faithful and dear brother who is one of you. Onesimus, Paul tells the folks at Colossae, is now our faithful and dear brother who is one of you. Onesimus has had a life-changing experience. He has come to Christ. Who was Onesimus? He was a slave in the household of Philemon. Philemon had come to Christ through the ministry of Paul, most probably during a visit to Ephesus, where Paul is currently in jail and where he's sending the letter from. Philemon was part of the Colossi church. Indeed, in the absence of church buildings, his was one of the houses folks would meet to share meals, communion, prayer, worship, and so on. But there had been trouble at Mill. Onesimus had run away. We don't know why. Perhaps Philemon had ill-treated him in some way. But there is a suggestion that he'd also stolen from Philemon before making his getaway. Onesimus means useful, which would no doubt be a misnomer if ever there was one as far as Philemon was concerned. Onesimus makes his way to Ephesus. We don't know if it was his intention to link up with Paul, who he would have heard Philemon talk about, but that is what happens nevertheless. After a period of time, and we don't know how long, Onesimus comes to faith. At the same time as this letter is written, uh, another letter is being delivered to Colossae, a personal letter from Paul to Philemon. It's a mere 25 verses, so why not have a read later on? 
The contents are mind-blowing. Remember that legally, Philemon had every right to have Onesimus executed. Runaway slaves could not expect a fair trial. Paul writes, I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. Formerly, he was useless to you, but now he has become useful to both you and me. I am sending him, who is my very heart, back to you. I would have liked to keep him with me so that he could take your place in helping me while I'm in chains for the gospel. But I didn't want to do anything without your consent, so that any favor you do would not seem forced, but would be voluntary. Perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. He is very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a fellow man and as a brother in the Lord. Legally, Philemon holds all the cards, but Paul reminds him and all slave owners, masters, provide your slaves with what is right and fair, because you know that you also have a master in heaven. Similarly, Paul charges all slaves in the fellowship, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord you are serving. Anyone who does wrong will be repaid for their wrongs, and there is no favoritism. Quite rightly, these verses dealing with slavery are difficult for us to grapple with. A fortnight ago, when this sermon was at this stage, I remembered that I had recorded but not yet watched the film 12 Years a Slave, set in North Carolina in the mid-19th century. In one scene, a particularly un-Jesus-like plantation owner, drunken, lecherous, tyrannical, sadistic, assured his slaves as he led the Sunday service that since slavery was in the Bible, he had a God-given right to treat his property however he liked, including delivering savage beatings. Clearly, he hadn't read Colossians or Philemon. A couple of weeks ago, John Collab was looking at Exodus 23. Israel had been delivered by God from slavery in Egypt. And now they were in transition as they journeyed to the promised land. And so they had to grapple with their newfound God-given freedom and ask themselves, how then shall we live? How do we live as God's people? What do we do with our new life of freedom? Paul isn't an apologist for slavery. He too must grapple with how those who have new life in Christ must live in the society and circumstances in which they are currently living, as we have to, as every generation, every Christian should. So consider what Paul is asking Philemon, his brother in Christ, to do. He is to forget his legal rights over Onesimus. He is to welcome Onesimus back into his household, who is also like Paul, his brother in Christ. And there is even a hint that he might go further and give Onesimus his freedom. Now imagine Phil meets his slave-owning mates at Colossi Golf Club and is asked, what's the script, Phil? You've taken back your runaway slave. You have your heat. You're letting the side down. 
where will this end? Maybe you should find another club to join. Hey, you could go golfing with your slave. Similarly, Onesimus might well be thinking, Paul, I prefer to stay here with you. After all, Philemon might not believe I've changed. He's got every reason not to trust me. He might not forgive me. He might have it in for me. Paul is demonstrating the practical difference being a disciple of Jesus makes to how we live our lives and engage with each other. Look at what it cost Jesus so that we could be reconciled to God. So we must be willing to do what it takes in the nitty-gritty of everyday life to be reconciled to one another. Barclay again comments, both slaves and free came together in the church. More than that, in the early church, it could and did happen that a slave was the leader of the church and the master was the humble church member. In the presence of God, the social distinctions of the world became irrelevant. Again, a couple of weeks ago when I was writing this sermon, Miriam posted the following on Facebook. In Denmark, there are libraries where you can borrow a person instead of a book to listen to their life story for 30 minutes. The goal is to fight prejudice. Each person has a title, unemployed or refugee or bipolar. But listening to their story, you realize how much you shouldn't judge a book by its cover. This innovative, brilliant project is active in 50 countries. It is called the Human Library. And Miriam posed the question, I wonder what my cover would say. What is yours? If folks were sitting together in this room just now, and I asked you to raise your hands, if you were confident that you had no blind spots and not one iota of prejudice towards anyone or any group, I would not expect to see any hands raised at all, and certainly not mine. It is only when we allow Jesus to challenge and change us that we will become intentionally vulnerable, to look beyond the labels we instinctively give some people, to step out of the silos we are apt to create around us, the social media echo chambers, and so on. I'll conclude with Colossians 3, 12 to 17 from the message. From now on, everyone is defined by Christ. Everyone is included in Christ. So chosen by God for this new life of love, dress in the wardrobe God picked out for you, compassion, kindness, humility, quiet strength, discipline, be even tempered, content with second place, quick to forgive an offense, forgive as quickly and completely as the master forgave you. And regardless of what else you put on, put on love, wear love, it's your basic, all-purpose garment. Never be without it. Let the peace of Christ keep you in tune with each other, in step with each other. None of this can often do in your own thing. And cultivate thankfulness. Let the word of Christ, the message, 
have the run of the house. Give it plenty of room in your lives. Instruct and direct one another using good common sense. And sing. Sing your hearts out to God. Let every detail in your lives, words, actions, whatever, be done in the name of the Master Jesus, thanking God the Father every step of the way. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you that he died and rose again to save us from our sins, to bring us back to you, to welcome us into your kingdom, to new life with you. And Father God, we pray that more and more Jesus would be the center of our lives, that he would be first in our lives, that all people we come into contact with, we would look at them through Jesus' eyes, people loved beyond measure, people who Jesus died for. Father God, we pray that more and more folk would come to know you as Savior and Lord, and that each of us who are already in Christ would play our full part in partnering you as you change lives. Amen. We sing that great hymn which expresses that fundamental truth. The Saviour died but rose again, triumphant from the grave, and pleads our cause at God's right hand, omnipotent to save. The Saviour died, but rose again.
So once more we gather around the table, which is the Lord's table. All are welcome to share in this meal. You don't share in it because you are strong, but because you're weak. Not because any goodness of your own gives you a right to come, but because we need mercy and help. We come because we love the Lord a bit and would like to love him more. We come because he first loved us and gave himself for us. So we lift our hearts and minds above the cares and fears of life and let our bread and wine be to us the token and pledge of the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, of the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. All meant for those who deceive him in faith. Hear the words of the institution of the supper, according to the Apostle Paul. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. And his death, of course, is part of that great story of God's creation and salvation, and looking forward to the time when he comes again in glory to establish his kingdom. And so we celebrate that story as we confess our faith together in the words of the Apostles' Creed. The words of the Creed will be on the screens. I believe. Let us pray. Gratitude and praise, hearts lifted high, voices full, joyful, these are what you deserve. For when we were nothing, you made us something. When we had no name, no faith, no future, you called us your children. And when we lost our way or turned away, you did not give up on us. And when we returned, your arms were open wide and welcome. And you prepared a table for us, offering not just bread or not just wine, but offering your very self, that we might be filled and forgiven, healed, blessed, and and made new again. Lord Jesus Christ, here with us now, for all that you've done and all that you've promised, what can we offer? Our hands are empty, our hearts sometimes full of wrong things. We are not fit to gather up crumbs from under your table. But with you is mercy and the power to change us. And so as we do here what you did in that upstairs room, may your Spirit be with and among us, that we may be confirmed in your love, empowered to serve, that we may become for you, your body, living, caring, and serving in the world until your kingdom comes. Amen. According then to the institution, the example, and the command of our Lord Jesus, and the memory of him, we do this on 
who on the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he'd given thanks for it, he broke it and said, this is my body which is being broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, saying, this cup is a new covenant, sealed by my blood. When you drink it, drink it in remembrance of me. So then taste and see that the Lord is good. Happy are those who find refuge in him. Take and eat. This is the body of Christ, which is broken for you. Do this remembering him. The cup was a new covenant sealed by Christ's blood, shed that the sins of many might be forgiven. Drink from it, remembering him. Let us pray. Gracious Father, we thank you for this food from heaven, the life of your Son. And we pray that by your grace you will help us to continue in the way of Christ, serving and loving until we come to the eternal kingdom with the blessed company of all who know and have known him and love him. Amen. Let's all pray together. Well, Lord, <clears throat> the last year or two has been really a time of great uncertainty with COVID-19 ruling so much of our lives. And we pray for those who have struggled with that uncertainty, particularly those who have been hampered by illness or bereavement not necessarily from COVID itself, but perhaps from other things as well. We pray for anyone who has been so affected that they would find comfort and healing. We pray for those who have struggled with the whole concept of lockdown and being shut indoors and not meeting their friends. We pray that in the days to come that they will find renewed hope enthusiasm for getting out and meeting up with their friends, meeting up with their church family. We pray for those who have really struggled with loneliness. Be with them, Lord, and help us to care for them, to look out for those that we've not seen and to try to make contact with them. We've all been bothered by having to wear masks for quite some time now. And many people find it quite stifling and are getting really fed up with them. Help us to see it through, Lord. Help us to enjoy the breath of your fresh air when we come out of the shops and can get them off again. We know it's the safest way, Lord. Just help us to keep at it. We've struggled with the whole concept of social distancing, of not being able to talk to people easily. Help us to be enthusiastic, to meet up with people, to make new friends, to spread your word to people that we haven't seen for a long time. We've had great difficulty coping with the uncertainty of the pandemic <clears throat> and we have equally great concerns about how safe the vaccines are. Some people find that very difficult to accept. We have the difficulty and the uncertainty of knowing what the future holds. Perhaps that's the way that you would have us be, Lord, faced with uncertainty and having to rely more on you. Help us to cope with this, we pray. And help us to cope with the uncertainty of knowing what's going to happen with the vaccines in the later part of the year the possibility of getting the COVID vaccine along with the, with the flu vaccine 
and how safe will that be? Talking of vaccines, we pray for those who have struggled to get their hands on, on vaccines. We have been lucky in this country in being able to acquire them easily, to make them ourselves. But we know there are many parts of the world where vaccines still are not freely available. Help those in countries like our own to share what we have, Lord, with our brothers and sisters in other countries. And we pray also for those places where the infection rates remain high, in places like South Africa and many other countries where there's a real concern at the present time. Where the numbers are high, the death rate's high. It really has been a terrible time, Lord. Help us to see our way through it. And along with COVID, we've also got climate change. And we're seeing more and more the effects that has. With the, the really marked heat wave in the northwest coast of America, with temperatures that they've not seen before. But in many other places, where the temperatures mean that crop fi crops fail, people go hungry, the water supply is in doubt, people may go thirsty, and the day-to-day -day life is just that much more difficult than it has been. We pray for all those who are stuck in these situations, Lord. And we pray for those for whom climate change seems to make so little importance, for those who always look to how they can make money and don't really worry wh what effect that is going to have on the climate. We pray for our governments that they would see the way forward to keep your world a better place, but also to recognise that it really is a global issue, the same as COVID, and it's not just something that a single country can make a big difference. And we pray, Lord, too, that as individuals, we would try to see what difference we could make as well. Help us in that. When we all return to normal, whatever normal now is, how much do we want it to be normal? How, want, how much do we want to see the benefits of this period as well as the problems? The benefits of realising that there's many things that we don't really need, but we get them anyway. So perhaps it's time to reassess what really matters for us. The benefits of having to rely more and more on other people on you, Lord. Help us to come to you and to put our trust in you, to put our reliance in you the way that you would have us do, Lord. Help us to live as you would have us live. And as a church, help us to see the way forward in terms of our worship, not back to normality, but back to other ways that we could do things other things that we could do, other ways that we can spread your word. Help us in that in the coming days, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen.